4G test and see if this actually crashes. I'm going to start from the inside with the full weight. I'm going to do the one pound pieces first. One pound bags. And I assure you, as bad as it looks, this is just sand in the bags. You didn't see anything. Right? Hey guys, so if you've been following along, then uh, you probably know that we determined that the failure of the pivot tube joining plate was the root cause of the transition failure and the eventual crash of the uh, version 1 VTOL prototype. And overall, I think the condition of, uh, of the wreckage was, uh, was pretty good and probably could have gotten away with uh, rebuilding, uh, regluing some of those components and uh, continuing on with that particular design, but I'm not one for passing up the opportunity to upgrade, so I think I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, make some design changes and see if we can improve on the overall performance. Uh, one of the, the major things I want to take a look at are the wings, and while I was pretty happy with the way the wings transitioned and the way the whole thing worked. There were a couple of issues. Now, one of the main issues was um, the frontal area of that wing when it's in the vertical flight. Basically, you can see that when that wing rolls up to its vertical position, we've got an awful lot of uh, frontal area. and. What, we, what I found was that this was really catching the wind, leading to a lot of weather veining and the wind kind of you know, pushing this uh, at will. Um, don't have a lot of yaw authority to begin with and having these big flat vertical surfaces really wasn't helping. So I'd like to see if I can minimize that front frontal area and still maintain an efficient flow over uh, the wing. And you, as you can see here in the version 1 wing on the left, the entire wing right up to the wing stub is doing the pivoting. What you see on the right hand side is the version 2 wing. and We'll take a closer look at that. Now the version 2 wing as you can see is a little bit longer so we have a little more length and we do have the outer section is tapered uh, down from the 8 inches of the root cord down to a uh, 5 inch tip cord so we have a taper there um, in addition to that I've built in about 2 degrees of um, twist in the wing to help with some of the slow speed uh, handling and to delay the stall out on the on the tip as long as possible. So here you can see the version 2 wing in operation and basically that center 10 inch section is going to be the only part that transitions from forward flight to vertical flight. That way we're still getting the airflow over the airfoil and not onto the flat wing surface, uh, yet minimizing how much of that wing is vertical during the hover phase so that we can try and minimize uh, the effects of wind on that. Also you'll note that the stub section and the outer section are staying in the forward flight mode. Since I'm using Onshape, uh, to do my 3D modeling and if you're not familiar with Onshape, Onshape is a uh, cloud-based 3D mechanical uh, modeling application and they have a sister application called SimScale and SimScale is a 
uh, again, a cloud-based application used for doing structural analysis and computational fluid dynamics, which is what I'm using it for here. And what you're looking at is an analysis of the wing um, at a two-degree angle of attack. So this would be uh, the angle that I'm predicting, um, the angle of incidence that I would set uh, in the next version. This would be the angle I would want the wing to be at at cruise. So um, at two degrees, I should be hitting my cruising speed. And what you can see here is that we've got nice, nice clean streamlines. The color of these streamlines is basically the velocity of the air over the wing. So you can see here uh, the free stream velocity uh, is in this light blue range and then as we get close to the stagnation point at the front of the wing you're seeing the the slower air, the darker, and then as we come up over the top of the wing you can see where we're picking up our velocity and then as we come across uh, the airfoil and down to the trailing edge. You can see we start to slow down again, um, some of that uh, vortex shedding in the back, and then eventually return to free stream. And you can see over here our wingtip vortex starting to form. Now this is what we want our, um, our streamlines over the wing to look like. Now, if we take a look at this model, this is our same wing at 30 degree angle of attack. This is the angle of attack that the version one wing would be at when we are in that last stage of transitioning from vertical flight to forward flight. So this is where the motors have pitched forward They've got 30 degrees angle of attack, and we're at the point where we're trying to pick up speed. And I noticed that during the flight that this was a very um, rough uh, flight regime for the, for the plane. When we got into this and started picking up speed and trying to make that transition, things got very rough here. And if we do this fluid... Uh, dynamics here, you're going to see that we've got this green here, we've got our free stream, and like before, it gets dark right here at the stagnation point, and then we have right here at the, uh, just beyond the leading edge, we've got our high velocity section. But you'll also notice that right over the top of the wing here, we've got these areas of low velocity that are lifting up. And what this is is the separation bubble. So the airflow is starting to separate over the top of the wing. So basically what's happening here is the wing is stalling. So when we're at that point where we're trying to get airflow over the wing, generate lift so that we can finish the transition, you can see that we're at a state where the wing is actually in a stall. So this would really answers, uh, explains why we have that, that violent, um, unstable bouncing around as we're making the transition. Basically, we're trying to get this wing to start flying and it's trying to stall. Um, so this is not what we want to see. And you can see here the vortex, wingtip vortex. Uh, is really quite pronounced here. So this is basically what we don't want to see. So I want to try and minimize this. If we take a look at the version 2 wing, what you can see here is that we've got pretty good free stream flow, uh, even flow lines over the stub section and the outer wing section, which are at that two degrees that we're looking for. So in this particular design, as we're uh, trying to make that transition, um, at least half of the wing is already at that two degree angle of attack and starting to generate lift. Now you can see here the center section is at 20 degrees. So that's the angle that I'm predicting we're going to 
uh, move the motor in the center section of the wing down to and try and generate speed. So here you can see that we are we don't have great attachment over this section um, but we do have good airflow attachment over uh, at least half of the wing. Um, the other thing to look at here too is that the motor and propeller are going to be on this center section and that prop is going to be the prop wash is going to be directly over that airfoil so really that is going to help lower the the induced angle of attack because that airflow is going to be directed um, over the airfoil instead of um, from the oncoming wind. So I hope that makes sense. But I believe that's going to help stabilize the airflow over that center section. Um, and we already have much better airflow over the stub uh, and this outer section. Okay, so let's take a look at how this version 2 wing is going to be constructed. So here you can see we have the stub section, the center section, and the outer section of the wing. And these are going to be um, hot wire, CNC hot wire cut. Also we have these end plates for all of the hot wire cut sections. And these are going to be you know, either ABS or more likely an eighth inch plywood uh, construction. And these really are going to help spread the load of the uh, carbon fiber spars coming in so that we're not getting load concentration on the foam and they're also going to give us uh, a nice um, smooth area smooth interface between these uh, sections here you can see we have the two the forward and rear spar two uh, 10 millimeter carbon fiber spars and basically these are going to run uh, from the center of the fuselage through the stub section where they'll be glued um, and then into the outer section and basically their job is to take all of the wing load um, across the whole wing and to join the stub section and the outer section together. Uh, the center section will be supported by this 16 millimeter carbon fiber tube uh, resurrected from the version 1 uh, pivot tube. So this will work very much the same way it did in version 1. The motor wires will come through this and this will control the pivot of the center section and the uh, motor in front of it. Also I've got this small um, pivot here that's going to be kind of a loose pivot between the center section and the outer section. Uh, to try and keep everything in alignment when the wing starts flexing. To guard against the failure, uh, wing failure that we saw last time, I'm going to take a little time and do some testing. So I'm going to build a prototype um, and then we're going to test it uh, to make sure it's going to be able to handle the loads. Not normally, uh, you know, the large uh, aircraft manufacturers do, you know, some pretty complex testing with uh, hydraulic rams and cables and things like that. Um, I'm going to take a page from the small home built uh, aircraft playbook here and do some uh, sandbag testing. And this is a spreadsheet that I borrowed from the Dark Arrow project. And, uh, I'll put a link to that. This is a, a pretty cool project. Three brothers uh, building a prototype for a home-built composite aircraft. And they put up this uh, spreadsheet for calculating um, test loads for a wing. And I did a little bit of research and I found that for the type and kind of class of the plane I'm, I'm designing, uh, we're going to be doing a 4G load test. So basically we're going to test the wing to uh, four times the load it would normally have in flight. And this spreadsheet basically allows us to put in our wing parameters and our loads and our G-factor and it will calculate this 
load district target, load distribution over here. Now the load on the wing, um, the lift on the wing is a distributed load across the whole wing. So we can't just put a point load at some point on the wing um, and assume that that is characteristic of the loads that it will see during flight. So lift basically is, is distributed across the wing and there is a distribution of that and uh, there are a couple of different ways to calculate that and they have that in here with an elliptical height distribution and a correction. Um, basically in here it gives me my stations along the wing every four inches and then up here at these individual stations it shows me what load needs to be applied to them. So at the root, we're going to be putting almost a two pound weight where out here on the tip, it's about 1.3 pounds. So let's get that wing built and get on to testing. Now this starts out just like most of my wings as a CNC hot wire cut EPP foam wing. And here I'm putting my wing beds together so that I can build the wing on top of it and maintain that complex geometry and the twist and everything. Um, I'm laminating the wing beds so that my glue doesn't squeeze out of the plane out of the wing uh, and stick to the wing bed. So this is a, a quick and easy way to uh, release the wings during building. Here I'm cutting the uh, spar lines and I'm dremeling out the pockets for the spar in the outer wing. I hot wire cut the spar slots uh, in the other wings because they were going all the way through. Now I'm cutting slots uh, in the top and bottom for the fiberglass bars. I'm using two millimeter fiberglass rods um, as spars on the top and the bottom. And these are just being uh, glued in with some white Gorilla Glue. Now, white Gorilla Glue is a polyurethane glue and it works better when it's moist. So what I like to do is take my spars and spray them down with a little bit of water before I press them into the glue. And this will cause the glue to foam up a little bit, which is what I'm looking for because it'll press that uh, foam glue into the nooks and crannies in the foam and really lock that spar in place. Now it's important too to make sure that your spars are lined up top and bottom and this is going to help um, work almost like a, an I-beam uh, with the spars as your top and bottom flanges and using the foam as the shear web in between. I also decided to cut out some eighth inch plywood end plates. Um, this is going to help me join the wing uh, to my test stand. The last step in the wing build is the laminating and here I'm just using a three mil document laminate uh, on the surface of the foam and this really creates a shell structure. And look, guys, this is play sand, even though it doesn't look like it. So I decided to build my own sandbags, and this way I could custom tailor the weight exactly to meet the targeted weight distribution. Unfortunately, uh, I realized after I made these bags that they resembled something else.
Okay, so now I have the prototype wing completed. And what I've done, I've got the center section in it, and that's the part that will rotate. And right now it's just taped in so that I have some place to put my weights when I am uh, doing the wing test on it. So you can see here on the bottom, I've got the markings for where I'm going to put the sandbags. So that's basically every four inches, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24. And we saw earlier how we've got a, um, a load distribution we're gonna try and match. What I did on this end is I cut a piece of eighth inch plywood and glued it to the end of the wing with the spars protruding through the end so that we can put it in the test fixture. Now, the test fixture is just made out of some MDF and plywood I had laying around. Uh, we've got the two holes for the spars. On the back side, I spaced it out a little bit, put another piece of plywood here, and I have these 12 millimeter spars. Um, that the 10 millimeter spars will slide into. And uh, then we'll put a couple of clamps on top just to hold this uh, as if it were glued to the wing. And then we'll just clamp this right to the edge of the bench. We have everything set up now. We've got the wing in the test stand and that's clamped in. And then I've got the test stand clamped to the bench. Another thing uh, that I have that's really hard to see is I've got a laser level on here. and I think you can see that on my hand. There it is on the ruler. And that's just so that when I do deflect, I can get an idea of how much deflection I'm getting and whether it's um, if coming back to, to neutral afterwards. So, as we looked at before, I'm going to be doing a 4G test load, and that equates to about 11 pounds on this wing, uh, distributed evenly. And I've got my uh, bags of sand all set and ready to go. But the first thing I want to do, I think, is do a 1G test and just see what it looks like at 1G. And 1G on this is going to be uh, right around two and a half pounds. So I'm going to grab a couple of these bags and just distribute two and a half pounds. And there's a half. So just to see what kind of deflection we're getting at 1G, you know, we're out here at the tip. You know, right around a half to five-eighths of an inch deflection. So that's not bad at all. So let's go ahead and set this up for uh, the full 4G test and see if this actually crashes. I'm going to start from the inside with the full weight. I'm going to do the one pound pieces first, one pound bags, and I assure you, as bad as it looks, this is just sand in the bags. I'm going to get roasted in the comments. Okay, so there we are. There is six pounds, and I'm going to go ahead now put the rest of the bags on. Uh, listen closely for any snaps, crackles, or pops. And there we are. There is 4G load on that. And let's see what we get here. Help if I turn that around, right? So, there's just short of a two inch deflection at the tip. I'm going to say inch and seven eighths. So, not bad. 
I would call that a success. It's pretty good flex, but that's a 4G load. I'm really happy with that. Now let's see if I can take it off without destroying it. see where we are here and that looks like we're pretty close to coming back to normal here so I'd say that is pretty much an elastic deformation I mean we may be just an eighth of an inch shy and that may be more back here than anything because there we're right back to where we were so uh, 4G test load and right back to our neutral line.